Now, after the official, let me thank you all as a, as a pastor, as a friend. Thank you all for uh, praying for me. And thank you all for sending me emails and messages and contacting me as I was gone for this past three weeks. It's, uh, it's been everything but expected. I thought things are going to go uh, differently. But uh, for you who don't know, I went three weeks ago, I uh, went to Serbia, to, my, to the old country, as Pastor Gordon likes to say, and uh, because my dad was declining in health and he couldn't take care of himself anymore, he was living alone uh, in our home, in the house where I grew up in. And uh, I had to put him in a nursing home. And uh, we spent a week together and then it took time to get everything arranged for a nursing home. Then he spent a week in a nursing home and a day before Jasmine and I were supposed to fly back, he passed away. So we had to postpone our trip, uh, have the funeral arranged, and uh, do everything according to the customs over there. And then after that, uh, come back over here. I thought that he's going to recover. I really thought that I, he had Alzheimer. So you know that that is a progressing disease and possibility of recovering is very, very slim. Uh, but uh, physically, I was hoping that he's going to recover in a nursing home in May. My sister and I were planning to go again and visit him and spend some more time with him. But uh, Lord had different plans. And I'm, I'm grateful for your prayers because Lord was so gracious to us. He gave us a week we spent together and uh, we had enough time to say goodbye. And uh, that week, I was glad I spent that week with him. But I also witnessed all of his suffering that he was going through. He was not a glimpse of a man I remember. And uh, he just fell asleep and didn't wake up. So I'm gracious, I'm, gr I'm grateful that Lord was gracious and gave him peace and gave me peace. And thank you all for, uh, for your prayers and your support. I really appreciate you guys here and you guys on our live stream. I know that many of you prayed and thank you. Now, you know how it goes. You reminisce a lot when these things happen. You kind of go back into the past and just pull out the craziest things that you remember, both good and bad. And uh, I, th this time, when I visited my hometown, this is the third time in the last 16 years. I really didn't go much there. But you know, when you walk into that, uh, you walk through the gate, you walk into the yard, you walk in the house, and you know the, that flush of memories that, that hits you, uh, and I was thinking about my dad a lot, of course. And uh, one of the things that I remember him, that I will remember him by, he, uh, he was a master in haggling. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you guys know what haggling is. I, uh, it's like when you bargain somebody for something forever. And you are so annoying that eventually you get whatever price you wanted to pay for, you're going to get it for. Well, that's what was he. That was one of his, like, uh, favorite activities to do anytime he had a chance. I remember as a kid, uh, we would go to the farmer's market every, every weekend. Uh, it, it's, it's a small, it's maybe like 50,000 people in my hometown. So the farmer's market in, is in the center, and that was not just the time to get stuff, but it was like when events happened and when people connected together. And I remember my dad. He would go there, and 20 minutes, he would haggle for a pound of apples. I, I kid you not. Like, like he, would, he would pick apples one by one in a bag until he has a pound. And then he would take them out, and he would like... This one is dented. I, I want a discount on this one. 
And then that would go back and forth. Like, okay, five bucks. I'll give you three. They would, they, they would bargain to cents. It's a farmer's market. <laughs> For goodness sakes. No, no, no. It had to be like that. And then, uh, I already know, I remember that. Seriously, it's, we're going there, and you have some guys, some sellers. They're like, oh, there's him. You know, you, you have hagglers, sellers, and hagglers, buyers. And when they meet, it's like, uh, it's amazing how much they like each other. But then, you're, you're, I, really, I remember one woman, one older lady, when she would see him, she would send somebody else to deal. She didn't want to deal with him, like, he's coming. No. <laughs> and uh, for me, it was just interesting, you know, to, to observe this, to see how this works. And, and, and uh, for him, it was a true pleasure. It was not about buying something. It was buying for less, no matter what. No matter what. And then on the other hand, uh, my mom, she despises haggling. She's like, five bucks, okay, five bucks, that's okay. Even if it's not worth, worth five bucks, she might not buy it, but if, somebody, if they're asking five bucks, okay, that's it. She doesn't want to go into that at all. So you can imagine, farmer's market, it was never a family event. It was always my dad over there, like, pointing something, and my mom over here, like, I don't know that man. <laughs> and then my sister and I running between two of them, kind of creating the connection. And uh, it's just one of those things that you remember. One of those things that come back and uh, hits you as a positive memory. And it made me think, like, uh, we all of us come from different cultures. We have Hispanic people here. We have Indonesian, Filipino people here. We have Americans here. Uh, and a whole bunch, and a whole mix in there, and all of us, oh, we, we have people from Africa, they love bargaining. My goodness, they love bargaining. <laughs> we went to Africa. I, I didn't know that the first time, but the second time, like, first time I was nice and polite when we went to Africa, and like, I paid what they asked for. They didn't ask much, so it's not that much of a big deal. So I, so I brought the figurine, and I told them, oh, I paid uh, 10 bucks for it. What did you do? So next time, when I went to buy another figurine, I paid it like two bucks. But it took me about 15 minutes because of the lessons I learned from my dad. <laughs> when is it acceptable to haggle and when is it not? So what makes a difference? For example, you go to farmer's market, it's, it's already expectable that you're going to do that. And the sellers, they have their prices set, but they're ready to go down because they know that whoever comes their way, they're going to try to bargain them down. And that is okay. Okay, I'll take a pound of apples, five bucks, I'll give you three. But you know what? I'll buy the cherries too, so give me a deal, cut me a deal. And they want to do that. That's okay. But imagine doing that in a Taco Bell. How about give me a five bucks, uh, five, bu five bucks lunch, five... Uh, five bucks uh, lunch box, I'll give you three bucks. No, sir, it's, it's five bucks. Okay, 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 give me chalupa too, but don't take cheese in it, and can you cut me a deal? Would you do that? How would you feel if your spouse started doing that in Taco Bell? It would be like, oh, Lord. <laughs> or your kid or somebody you're with over there. So, uh, there are certain rules of social engagement that define when something is appropriate and when it is not. In our society, in American society, you go to a farmer's market, it's perfectly fine to do that. But, you go to a restaurant, you wouldn't even think about it. It's kind of embarrassing to even try to do something like that, right? You go to Serbia, you can do that in a restaurant. You know, there, there are some places where you can really try. Okay, I, there is four of us. Come on, you want to cut us a deal or something like that. But, but essentially, uh, we know after a certain period of time of living as part of this society, we know very well how to behave. We know very well what is acceptable and what is not. And we know very well when we embarrass ourselves when, do, when we do something or when we, when we embarrass our spouse, God forbid. That's much worse than embarrassing ourselves. Uh, 
So essentially, the question now that's, that's running through my mind, pretty much the title of my sermon, is it okay to bargain with God? Is it okay to come to God and then say, okay, Lord, so I read the Bible, but can we discuss it? Is that something that we are even allowed to think about? Is that something that we even should be discussing right now? Because here's the thing. Uh, our prayers, when we pray, usually our prayers end uh, with may or will be done. Especially when we pray for somebody or something that we, we would really like to happen. Because here's the thing. I don't know how is this prayer going to pan out. Is it going to come back fulfilled or is it going to come back empty? So, to protect myself, I'm going to put out there, may or will be done. So, whatever happens, it's not my responsibility, it's God's responsibility. And I'm okay with that. But is God okay with that? Is God okay with us just may or will be done? And let's move on. For us, it's much easier to say that because it protects us from disappointment and doubt if prayer doesn't go the way we wanted to do it. But what if God wants us to pray and bargain with Him in our prayers? What if God wants us to haggle with Him when we talk to Him? For a Christian mind, that is like almost inconceivable because our rules of spiritual social engagement tells us you read the Bible what does the Bible say that you should do no questions asked what we tend to forget is the origins of our faith but before we go there I would like us to read a Bible verse Matthew chapter 23 I would like us to read verses 1 to 3 so, this is after Jesus had a long discussion with Pharisees, and they keep coming back at him, just arguing and arguing and arguing their arguments. And this is what he tells them. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So, do and observe whatever they tell you but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. Does this sound like a rebellion to you? Does this sound like Jesus is calling them to stand up against their religious teachers? Maybe. Maybe not. He's telling them, hey, you know what? When they're in Moses' seat, and Moses' seat. So when, when Bible says that Pharisees are sitting in Moses' seat, uh, traditionally at their time, that was the time when a religious teacher would take a seat, he would open the scroll, and he would read from the Holy Scriptures to the people. So these were not his words. He was literally just reading the scriptures. Jesus tells them, when he is in Moses' seat, when he is reading you the Bible, you better make sure you listen, you better make sure you observe. But when you look at them acting, make sure you don't do that. Because they talk one thing and they act differently. Now, why would Jesus bring this up? Apparently, this was a problem in his time. Because what was happening? So, Pharisees, <clears throat> they had the scriptures. They had pretty much what we know now is the Old Testament. They had their scriptures. But they also had their own set of rules. And every single teacher, like the next big rabbi that would come, he would tweak those rules by his own understanding or, or ideas that he has. So, pretty much, uh, they would more act on those rules than they would act on the Bible. And Jesus even tells them, what did you do? You took the commandment of God and you put it below your own commandments and now you're making people act on your commandments instead of commandments of God. So what Jesus is telling them over here, you listen 
to what the Word of God says. But make sure you don't obey but why, by what these religious teachers tell you to do. And this is the main reason why people are lazy. We are lazy when it comes to spiritual effort. Think about this. Why do we have the church? How did church even come to existence? Through this laziness. <coughs> church is an organization as we have it right now. Because here's the deal. I really don't have the time. Why don't you just tell me? You know how many times I heard that from, from people here in the church, especially from the young people. Milos, just tell us. No, no, you have to read the Bible. You, you have, if you want to have the answer, if you want to understand what is on God's mind, if you want to understand what life is supposed to be and so on, you need to read the Bible. Like, you, you mean the whole Bible? Like, no, no, just the headlines. No, of course, the whole Bible. You have to read the whole Bible. Just tell us. This laziness brought some people a long time ago to an understanding that they can capitalize on this laziness. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, I'll tell you. You know what? We'll be collecting some donations, and then after that I'm going to open the Word of God, and I'm going to explain what God told to me, but you have to be here and bring your donations. And that's why church is so rich and so big, and so magnificent, I'm talking in general about the Christian church, all of the churches, because we are lazy. And the price for laziness, the price for that convenience, is what Jesus was talking about over here. Because here's the thing. If you guys are too busy to read your Bibles, if you guys are too busy to take the time every day and listen to what God has to tell you, I can tell you whatever I want. And you're going to believe me because I'm the pastor. You're going to believe me because you know me for a long time, because I visited you when you were sick, because I married you, because I buried your uh, loved ones, because I am kind of a part of the family for, for, for some of you here. For all of these years. And I can tell you whatever I want. And based on that trust. You might adopt some ideas. That are completely non-biblical. But you will do that. Because you are too lazy to read the Bible. You have no idea. Millions of people. Live like that. Millions of people just put their trust. In the religious teachers. Instead of the word of God. And what do we get? We get a completely misled generations of Christians who have actually no idea what God wants for them. And in order for them to find out, they have to put an effort that seems too much. And that's where we get people who don't understand the Bible. That's where we get people who actually believe that bargaining with God is a bad thing. So what does the Bible say? On, se on the seventh day, on Sabbath day, you're going to uh, rest, and you're not going to do any work, and you're going to go and worship me. God, may I? I, I have a question about it, and I have an idea. Can we discuss this? A lot of Christians would say, no, there is no discussion here. This is what the Bible says, and that's it. But what if God wanted you to come to him and bargain with him, negotiate with him a little bit? Where do the lines of this spiritual, social engagement blur and where we become actually empowered to do that? We say just obey the Bible. Why do we do that? Our, historically, our church... What was the first church? Tell me. What was the first, after Jesus' ascension and after that first church, what was the first church, official church that came to existence? Anybody? Give me a name. Catholic Church. Thank you very much. 
So Catholic Church was officially founded in the 3rd century by Roman Emperor Constantine, and that's when they started building their authority as uh, an incorporated entity in the world. Later on down the road, they became a Roman Catholic Church. But, but essentially, this is their idea. One of the major lessons from Catholicism says faith has no questions. So, if I tell you that this is the way to go, you don't challenge that. You don't challenge that because that comes straight from God. Church is from God, so you don't challenge God. You never do that. You simply obey. If the Bible says so, you will not question it. You will not ask why. You will not ask for an explanation. You will embrace it and do it. That's it. Nevertheless, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Bible wants us. That's not how Bible wants us to do things with God. We are too stuck on what we think the God wants us to have a relationship with to actually see it a little bit differently, to think outside the box. And I would like us today to take some time right now and study two stories from the Old Testament. There are two stories that actually explain how is it allowed to us to haggle with God? And what are we supposed to haggle with God on? There are things that are non-negotiable, but there are plenty of things there are that are. We just don't do it. And we miss on the opportunity to be blessed by God. So, let's do this. Let's go to Genesis, book of Genesis. If you have your Bibles, verses will be on the screen for the lazy ones. But if you have your... <laughs> But if you have your Bibles, find Genesis chapter 6. So, uh, first we're going to read one verse that tells us about a very special character from the Bible. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Now, if we would base our idea of who Noah was... We have an impression that he was an amazing guy. Because we know from Genesis chapter 6 that his generation was horrible. Like they were so bad that even God lost hope for them. God was like, like these guys are gone. These guys are like, there, there is nothing I can do for these guys anymore. So Noah, it says he was a righteous man. And apparently that made him stand out from his generation. He was a blameless in his generation, which means that before God, uh, Genesis 6 tells us that God condemned the whole generation of people of his time except Noah. Why? Noah walked with God. His life revolved around his connection with his creator. Everything he did drove him to do it with God. As a consequence of that, God deemed him righteous, and that's why he was blameless in the condemnation of the whole world. So, what happens? God comes to Noah and tells him, Okay, Noah, this is what's happening. I can't do anything anymore for this world. I'm going to wipe it all down. I'm going to kill Everybody, I'm going to destroy everything. And Noah is like, oh boy. But hey, you, you relax. You're good. You and your family, I have a plan for you. And this is the plan. And then God hands him the plan. You will build an ark and, and you guys know the story. So, pretty much God tells him, I'm going to kill everybody, but you're okay. You're fine. You don't have to worry about that. And then, what did Noah do? Look at verse 22. And Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Now, based on, on this statement over here that Moses writes about Noah, Noah is the perfect man of God, right? 
God tells him, I have a job for you. This is what's going to happen. And Noah simply does it. Would you, would you agree with me that Noah is a, is a good example of a good man of God? We agree with that, right? Nevertheless, not everybody would agree with us. We agree with this because we are Christians. Because our background is Roman Catholic. Not as much as genuinely, originally, Hebraic way of thinking. So, let me explain. When Bible was given, Bible was the Holy Scriptures. It was written by the prophets, kings, and different people that were inspired by God to write the Word of God and give us an instruction for life, pretty much. Now, uh, today, you guys know, when you read the Bible, there are things that are really not clear. Like, what is he trying to say here? Have you ever experienced that? You know what I'm talking about. Right. So what do you do? Google it. That's the easiest way to do it. Or you just, if you have a preferred commentary on the Bible, you open the commentary and, ah, okay. So this is the historical background. This is the cultural background. Ah, now it makes sense. Okay. So the commentaries on the Bible are written to help us better understand the Bible and what is it trying to say. Just because the Bible was written such a long time ago that we get disconnected, from the, especially from the historical and cultural background of the Bible. Nevertheless, we were not the first ones to deal with that issue. First ones actually to write the commentaries on the Bible were Jews themselves, way back in the Old Testament times. And those commentaries uh, were, are called Talmud. Maybe you heard uh, that name or not, but pretty much rabbis, scholars of that time, they would read the Bible and then people would ask them, Rabbi, what does this mean? And he's like, okay, I better write it down because somebody else is going to ask me again. I can just hand them the paper so they can read it. And that's how Talmud came to existence. Now, Talmud is the original commentary. It's the closest to uh, the revelation of God that we pretty much have to understand the Bible a little bit better. That first commentary talks about the story that we just read. Talks about Noah being the worst possible guy out there. Rabbis are reading the story of Noah and they're like, I don't want to read this anymore. Get this away from me. They were so despised. They so despised Noah. They were so disgusted with what Noah did that they didn't want to read the Bible anymore. Like, I don't want to do this study anymore. This is horrible. This is just bad. For some reason, you can find this. It's easy to find this in, if you just look it up. For some reason, and we're going to talk about this reason, they looked at Noah and what we just read. And we came to a conclusion that Noah was the great guy. And they came to a conclusion, like thousands of years back, while God was still visibly present in their nation, they came to a conclusion that Noah was a horrible person. How come? Well, anyways, they kind of get over this, uh, this feeling of uh, leaving the Bible. They keep reading. Let's keep studying. Let's keep reading the Genesis. So they keep studying the Genesis further. And they get to Genesis chapter 15. They come to the story of Abraham. And they read about Abraham. And they read about how God told him, pick up your stuff, pack everything, get your wife and kids, and go, and I'll tell you where to go. And then they read the stories about the promise that God made to Abraham. And God told Abraham, hey, you're too old to have kids but rest assured, I'm going to take care of that. It's on me. I'm going to make sure you get a kid. And then as a response to this, Abraham, Bible says, and he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham, Abraham lived true life of faith. He lived by faith. When he packed up his things, he sat in his car and he's like, so, Lord, where do I go? I-25 North, I-70 East, where do I go? Just, just take the road, just take the high. I'm going to let you know. And he's like, oh, okay, the weather looks nice in Kansas. Let's go that way. 
That was the faith that Abraham had. He had no idea where he's going. God tells him, he's 100 years old. God tells him, you're going to have a child. It was so ridiculous that his wife, Sarah, laughed at it. She's like, what, what did he say? You know, and, 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 and God tells her, wait, did you, did you just laugh at me? And she's like, no, no, I didn't. But uh, it, it was so ridiculous. It's impossible that that happened. But Abraham believed. And the Lord saw his faith. Abraham is the perfect example of how we should live our lives. When things make no sense, we trust in the Lord. When things go the wrong way, the way we didn't expect, we trust in the Lord. Just like Abraham did. And now, Abraham... Uh, Lord comes to Abraham and he tells him one more time, you're going to have a son, don't worry, I have that taken care of. And Abraham is, okay, whatever the will of the Lord is. And then God turns back and he says, you know what, it's really not cool for me. He, he's my, such a good servant, I can't hide from him what I'm about to do. And then we come to uh, Genesis chapter 18. Let's read these verses. So Genesis chapter 18 Verses 20 to 23. This is what God tells Abraham about his future plans. And then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the Lord tells Abraham, these guys in Sodom and Gomorrah, they are over it. They're done. They're toast. Like what I hear about them, that's it. I have nothing else for them. So I'm going to go and check out and see if that is true. And then I'm going to handle it. And now Abraham knows who lives in Sodom and Gomorrah. His nephew, Lot, he lives over there. He's the first one that, that lives over there. He knows, oh my goodness, Lot lives over there. And then uh, just some time before this one, a uh, couple of years back, Abraham was waging a war and his allies were Sodom and Gomorrah. And they actually won that war. And Abraham was kind of like brother in blood with those people over there. But he knew very well what kind of people lived there? He knew how bad they were. That's why he didn't live there. He told Lot, you know what? If, if you're going to go there, I'm going to go the other way. I'm not going to live with them over there. He knew how bad they were. And now, God tells the plan to Abraham. They're done. I'm going to go there and destroy them. And then this is the response of Abraham. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. And then Abraham drew near and he said, Hey, will you indeed sweep away righteous with the wicked? And this is where this iconic haggling with God starts. So, Lord, so... What if there are like 50 people there? You know, 50 good people. Like, would you really destroy the whole city and destroy them with? So the so Lord is like, okay, Abraham. All right. Okay, cool. If there are 50 people, we're good. I'm going to spare the cities. Hey, 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 Lord. And he didn't do this once. He didn't do this twice. He did this five times. He bargains down. He bargains down to five righteous people. <laughs> no, that's, that's like, I thought my dad was master of haggling. When I read the story of Abraham, like, oh, yes. He bargained God down to 10% of the price. Like this, you, you can't beat that. <laughs> that's amazing. You know? And now the rabbis, they're reading this story. And they're writing their experience in Talmud. And, and they stopped here. And they threw a toast to Abraham. And they parted. They celebrated with what Abraham did. Because 
yes, this is the right thing to do. Look at Noah. Look at this horrible guy, Noah, over here. But Abraham, yes, that's what. That's what's the right way to go. Now, my question for you guys. What is the difference between Noah and Abraham? Both of them were the men of God. Both of them were blameless and righteous in God's eyes. Both, both of them obeyed God's commandments. But why would the people of God who read these scriptures, who were so close to him, see Noah as such a bad guy and Abraham as such a good guy? What was the difference? I don't mind uncomfortable silence. Huh? Noah didn't try to do anything to save anybody but his family. Peter calls Noah the herald of righteousness. So apparently the way that he lived a life was uh, announcing to other people what righteous means to be. But then Jesus, when Jesus talks about, talks about the time of Noah, he says they were... Uh, eating and drinking and uh, working and getting married. And they were completely oblivious of what is going to happen until the day the flood came. So Noah didn't tell them a word about what's going on. Like, but just imagine him. Like uh, Noah is building an ark. He's building a huge ship in his backyard. And his neighbors are like, you crazy, what in the world are you doing? Wouldn't he have told them, guys, this is what's happening. The flood is coming. God is going to destroy the world. I'm trying to, I, he told me that I can save. Jesus says they had no idea what's going on. Noah didn't move a finger to help his generation. God didn't ask him to do that. So you can't blame him. Nevertheless, the reason why he was perceived as a bad guy with that action is when he is compared to Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham, Abraham comes and he bargains with God for the life of people. Now, if he didn't do that, who knows if his nephew Lot would be alive? Because you remember what God did. After talking to Abraham, angels go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and instead of raining the fire down, they're like, hey, Lot, you got to go with us. Come on, pick up your stuff. And then Bible says, like, Lot, he was dragging his feet. He's like, I can't leave. Like, guys, what's, what are you talking about? Until things got really bad, really ugly. Uh, he wouldn't leave. They literally, Bible says, they literally dragged him out of the city. To save him. Why? On Abraham's haggling. Do you haggle with God when you pray? Do you try to negotiate with him? Do you try to plead with him? Or you just send your prayer with, well, Lord, whatever you want, may that be done. And wash your hands from it. Maybe I should have haggled more. This is, this is where this sermon is coming from. And this is where the thought in my head comes from. Maybe I should have haggled more for days of life of my dad. Maybe I shouldn't have just given up and say, Well, Lord, he is in your hands. Whatever you want to do. Maybe my dad would be alive today. Maybe he would be alive in May. When my sister and I were planning to visit him. Maybe I missed an opportunity. On a blessing. Because I didn't dare asking. The biggest problem we have as Christians. Is that very often. We don't feel at home. When we pray. Jews, they feel at home when they pray. We not so much. 
like an example that a professor I listened to, uh, how, how she explained this. She said like, when you come to church with your kids, and then after the worship service, you go home and have lunch. You take your kids with you, of course, and you come home and your kids get into the home. How do they act? Oh, throw the shoes away, jump on the, jump on the couch, open the fridge, get that juice over there, run up the stairs, yell, scream, and so on, right? That's how kids act, and that's fine. They're in their own home, whatever. That's okay. Now imagine you're invited for lunch to another, to your friend's home. Do your kids act in the same way? Woo, let's run and jump, open the fridge. Do they act that way? It's going to be a very, very interesting evening with them. <laughs> like, we're going to talk about it when we get home. You guys remember that sentence? We're going to talk about it when we get home. That is the moment when like, everything just darkens out. <laughs> I remember that. But you go to somebody else's home, they, are, they, they behave until you let them loose, you know? Okay, take your shoes off. They take their shoes nicely and put them next to the door. They go sit on the couch and they sit there. Just, okay, now go play with the kids. Woo! Then they go and run and do whatever. Sometimes our prayers are like that. Sometimes uh, we are supposed to be at home when we pray to our God. We are supposed to be shoes in the air and hugging our dad and just just rolling over him while he's trying to check his email. You know, that's, that's what our prayer is supposed to be with God. And very often it's sitting on the edge of the couch. Hi. Very often that is our prayer. That's what the people of God of the old understood. And that's why Abraham dared to haggle. He was not the first one. You have King David, King David bargaining for the life of his child. You guys remember that story when he made that tremendous mistake with Bathsheba. And when, when, he, uh, when she gave a birth, the child was sick and the Lord told him through prophet Nathan, the child will die as a consequence of your actions. And he pleaded with God. He pleaded. He didn't eat. He, he didn't drink anything. He got sick that his, his aides were really worried. Like, what are we going to do with him? My goodness, what's going to happen when the child dies? He's going to kill himself. And then when the child died, King David got up. He shaved himself. He took a shower. He took a meal. And then they asked him, like, what? While the child was still alive, you were, you were crying and falling. And now when the child is dead, you're okay? And then he says to them, well, you know what? While the child was alive, I was hoping I can plead the Lord. I was hoping he's going to hear me. I really thought that he might do something. But now that the child is gone, I understand that this is the will of the Lord. And I'm moving on. We don't do that. We don't plead with the Lord that deeply. Because we are told by our religious leaders that you just do it. You just do it this way and that's all you need to do. And that's not what God wants. God doesn't just want you to, okay, here's five bucks. No, try me. Offer me three bucks. Let's haggle a little bit. Tell me what you want. Tell me how really you want it. Tell me why you want it. Let's talk about this. That's what the story of Abraham tells us. That's why Noah was the bad guy in the eyes of people of that time. Because he didn't even try. Maybe he could have saved somebody else too. Like Abraham did. My dear friends. I really encourage you to look into your life. To look into people that surround you. To people you care for. Look into your prayers. And ask yourself, am I sitting in my daddy's lap when I pray or I'm sitting on the other side of the office desk when I pray? Am I talking to my daddy when I pour out my prayers or I'm talking to the boss, king, lord, whatever he is? He is all of that. That's fine. 
But he is our daddy. And we don't treat him that way. And that's why we don't get blessed. So stop worrying. Instead, look at your worries. Look at your mighty father. And then go to him and tell him, Dad, I really... How, how can we make this happen? Because here's the thing. He's going to negotiate back. He's going to open the doors. If you keep asking, he's going to show you. Because he wants to talk back to us. He wants us to communicate. Not just, may or will be done, let's hope for the best now. That's what we do very often. He doesn't want us to hope for the best. He wants us to ask for the best. And then he will lead us through. How everything panned out in the end with my dad, I really see it as a blessing. Because he was suffering and we were suffering and he left in peace. And I thank God for that. Maybe it could have been better if I, if I had asked. I don't know now. I will not get that answer. But I know definitely one thing. My haggle begins today. Because, because that's what God wants. To bless us. And we are not blessed because we don't haggle. So haggle my friends. And may it be to your blessing. May it be to his glory. Amen.